Welcome once again to the chat room. Nice to have your company. This is the program I like to call the fastest 28 minutes on television where we grab a huge topic and cover it all in 28 minutes. And the man doing the hard work is the Dean of Sydney, Philip Jensen. Philip, good day. Hello, Kel. And what I want to know is can we do a little topic so no, we no, can no. stretch it out farther? It's in your job description. We'll tackle hard topics, it says. <laughs> huge topics. <laughs> yeah, huge topics. Yes. And we're coming to you in this program via the miracle of television or possibly the miracle of uh, video streaming or the miracle of DVD. Uh, in fact, are they miracles? That's funny, isn't it? We use the word miracle in lots of loose ways, don't we? Different ways. Yes. I mean, what do we mean when you say it's the modern miracle of? It's just something that we couldn't imagine previously, is it? Or something I can't explain. If I don't ah, know what's happening under the hood, you can't explain it's it. a miracle. I live in a miraculous world. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all do. Yes. And, and but sometimes it just means uh, highly unlikely or, yes. or unusual experience. If someone got uh, three hole-in-ones in three... There's always miraculous round of yes. golf, which just means highly yes. unlikely, highly yeah. unusual. What is a miracle really? Oh, I don't know in that <laughs> regard then. I mean, in the, in the Bible, uh, it, it translates words about uh, wonder, amazement, astonishing. So it's used like miracle in the sense we're meaning. We're surprised. We're surprised. Yes. Uh, but also there's a word sign, symbol, uh, which... So Jesus, especially in John's Gospel, has a certain set of signs, like the turning of water into wine, which we would call miracles. Right. Um, but the word has its kind of uh, philosophical, theological kind of uh, control um, through the idea of a, a suspension of natural order. There are laws of nature, and if they're stopped for a bit... That's a miracle. Yes. So something doesn't have... I, I pick this cup up and I drop it, but it actually doesn't go down, it goes upwards. Yes. Well, then the law of gravity has been suddenly suspended or overcome or... What only the special effects department in Hollywood can do... <laughs> yes. If we see it happening, that's a miracle. My father used to say it's all done with smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Never and, believe anything. And wires smoke and, and computer-generated special yeah, effects. That's right. Well, there's a special effect of, uh, of a golfer walking out on the... Yes. On the water, um, which you've got to say, well, that's, that's a special effects thing, isn't it? But if we saw it on Sydney Harbour or Warragamba yes. Dam, we'd say, that's a miracle. No, my father has taught me it's done with smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> it's all done that but way. But it wasn't done in biblical times with smoke and mirrors. No, presumably not. So there but really were laws of nature which were changed or... Yes, now our problem lies with these laws of nature. Right. That is... Uh, God has created the world and he's created it in an orderly fashion and so it continues to operate. Now, in the 18th century, we discovered machines and with the discovery of machines, our way of thinking changed. That's like the discovery of computers in the 20th century. People now use computer language to talk about downloading ideas. And, yes. And, and so we, we think as if the brain is like the hardware and there's programs on it that are the software that are... Yes. And the brain is not like that, really. No. But the computer is such an incredible invention that it has now taken over the way we think about all kinds of things. Well, the 18th century, uh, 17th, 18th century, the Industrial Revolution, machines were incredible. Steam, clockwork. Yes, and the making of cloth by machines. Yes. One of the spinning jenny and so on. And so instead of individuals having to do everything, this machine just did it all the time. So it becomes a model. It's a model that dominates the way we think. Yes. We think, this is obviously so clever, this reality must be like this. Yes. And so the world became like that. Right. Now, that then moved God into what is technically known as deism. So the, the machinists, the people who said, the world's a machine... God's the machine maker. They are called deists. Deists. Right. D-E-I-S-T. Yep. And so <clears throat> God is like the clockmaker. He's made the clock. He's wound it up. And now it is just ticking along by its laws and rules. Inevitably. Unstoppably. It is just ticking along. So that's where the idea of laws of nature come from? And they are firmly fixed. Right. Once the machine is made, there is no alteration. That is it. So before the machines, we would have said, well, it's the regular pattern. Yes. After the machine, we say, it's the unchangeable law. That's right. And so we then look for miracles in terms of God sticking his fingers in the, in the mechanism yes. and stopping things. So 
if my cup goes upwards, well, it's because some law of nature has been intervened with God, and that's a miracle. Yep. So it's, it's breaking the laws of nature becomes the miracle, and therefore it becomes for the, for the deist um, uh, a sign of God's existence. If you want to know, if you want to prove God exists, look, here's a miracle. Here's something. Now, now what kinds of consequences are there? Well, on the one hand, you have people who therefore get rid of God altogether because there's just this machine operating all the time. And if I could ever find out how it operated without the person building it in the first place, I can dispense. And to some extent, the naturalists who were persuaded of Darwinianism in the 19th century, it meant they got rid of God. There's an explanation for the machine that yep. doesn't need a starter. The other thing it does, people have, I've had people say to me over the years, the machine runs without God. I don't disbelieve in God. No, God's no. there, but long way off. Yep. Not interested in us. That's right. That comes out of deism, doesn't it? That comes out of it as well. So there was a, there was a big hailstorm in our place, oh, I don't know, five, ten years ago, I can't remember when now, but all our suburb got, got these huge hailstones um, falling on us and wrecking our roofs. And um, several people around us said, I thought it was the judgment of God, I thought it was the end of the world. And all kinds of, uh, some semi-superstitious things were said by people. Uh, I commented on this in a magazine, got a very strong answer back from someone saying, it's ridiculous to think it's the hand of God, it's just the laws of nature. Right. God's not involved, the laws of nature run the world. And so, to think of God in the middle of a hailstorm is, is superstitious and nonsense because there is, God's not there. The hailstorms come for laws of nature. Is it appropriate at this stage for me to say, look, is the Bible deist? Does the Bible say what God does is to set the world running and then stand back? It, it's very appropriate to make sure that no one turns off at this stage of the game and only gets yes. half the story. Not that anybody would, of it's course. It's riveting, isn't it? It's yeah, riveting. It uh, yeah, the Bible is against deism. The right. Bible's theistic. That is, God has created and supervises and organises the continuation of everything that happens. So Jesus says, not a sparrow falls to the hand, uh, the ground without the will of the Father. And every hair on my head is numbered. And so hourly, daily, every time I comb my hair, God is actually involved in recalibrating the numbers in heaven. God is involved intimately in the most small insignificant details such as how it's many a, hairs I've got. A mutual friend of ours says God knows every hair of my head and where they've all gone. <laughs> yes, that's right. But, but the point is that the so-called laws of nature then are God actively at work. It is God yes. holding the, the molecules and the subatomic particles together. Together, doing it in a way that is regular and consistent. Yes, if God stopped, it would fall apart. Yes. yes. And if God was a fickle God, he could do it differently. But he's not a fickle God. And so he does it consistently in the same pattern all the time. Or if he does do it differently, it's for a special reason, to attract our attention or to well, tell us something. I'm not even sure that he ever does it differently. Right. That is, the, the way the world is constructed is much more complicated than we normally think. Yes. And he can use the laws of, the, the so-called laws of nature that he has created, he can use them any way he likes. So human, human beings can be overconfident that we understand all the details. Sure. When in fact there's a lot more sure. subtlety and sophistication than I we mean, understand. The crossing of the Red Sea, <clears throat> you would think, was a massive miracle when the waters part and all the people of Israel cross across. But the Bible tells us God sent a great north wind to do it. Yes. East wind? East a wind. A great wind. East wind. Uh, right. And so that, that God did it is what the Bible says. But God didn't suspend natural laws in order to do it. He, he used just, them. He used yes. them. And there's a classic uh, story of the, the man who falls out of a skyscraper. Um, now, can he be saved? The deer says, no, once you're in the once once you let go, gravity takes over, that's it. Um, and so there's no point praying to God. God can't do anything. It's fixed. Well, um, I remember reading of a man falling out of a skyscraper window and halfway down, huge wind current swept him in to a window on about the 30th floor or so. <laughs> Much to the surprise of people working on that floor. Yes. That is, God can save a person, but he doesn't have to suspend nature to do it. He can use. The laws of the wind were the laws of, and they 
Yes, so-called laws of nature yeah. are operating. And so he operates through what is in this world. Now, he may suspend, he may do things differently. I'm not saying he can't, I'm just saying there's no primary reason to think that he is because things are more complicated than we generally know. But what happens if we start thinking miracles are important? What if we, if we start thinking without intending yes. to, thinking like the deist, thinking the world's a machine, and thinking I can really only know God or see God if something really different or spectacular happens? And at this point you get, firstly, cynicism, my father, <laughs> smoke right. and mirrors. Secondly, you get the God of the gaps. That is, the miracle is what I can't explain. Right. And the more knowledge I get, the more explanations I get, well, the fewer the miracles. And the smaller the number of the miracles, the smaller God gets. So as I come to each and every explanation, I actually whittle God down until in the end, God is just the creator of life. And when someone shows us how to create life... Not even that. He's yeah. there, not even that. Now, I'm not expecting anybody's going to show us that. But if it were, then God disappears altogether. Um, and God is only, therefore, as, as big as my mind, so to speak, or as small as my mind. As my mind and knowledge grows, God yes. gets smaller. We're allowing human knowledge to define yeah. God's role. And then the other side of it is I go looking for miracles all the time, and right. I'm super impressed by miracles. So at one level there's the cynicism of smoke and mirror dad, Oh, he's a lovely man, but, <laughs> yes. and he was very wise to teach me, so as not to be gullible because the other side of it is gullibility. Right. And there's terrible gullibility about miracles. People believe the most incredible stories, which uh, a few moments reflection and uh, careful research would show it's just not true. Um, so, yes, you get gullibility and credulity, so it's unhelpful to think about miracles in those terms, to think as, yes. a, as a deist. Yeah. Okay, so how do we think biblically? How do we biblically think about... God is at work in everything. Right. The grass grows because of God. The hailstorm comes and the rain comes and the sun comes because of God. That uh, We're taught in Hebrews 1 that, that, that he holds everything by the word of his power, that he sustains everything all the time. And every good gift comes from the Father of the heavenly yes, lights. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so we can pray to God for anything and everything, and we can be content with anything and everything. So the Bible teaches us two things about God's sovereignty. One is contentment. The other is the ability to have things change. Right. Because he's sovereign, he can change whatever is happening. And so it's always right to ask him for rains or for the hailstorm to stop or for the hailstorm to come if you want one. And God can do it, whatever it is we're asking. So Paul can say, I I'm content. Whether I'm poor or well off, I'm content. I'm content because God's in charge. Yes. But it also gives me a license to ask him to change things. To change things. So I've got this other thing. Contentment yes. and yes. change are both available to us. Because, because God is in charge. Of, because we see the hand of God over everything. Yes. And from the biggest things, crossing Red Seas, down to the smallest things, number of hairs on our head. Which... I remember as a very young Christian, sitting at a bus stop feeling sick as I was going out from school, uh, early crook and I, I just I prayed for a bus and a bus turned up now yes. as a very young Christian that impressed me yes uh, um, but it was still the right thing to do it's the right thing to do it's the, to pray for it it's the right thing to thank God for it but you've got to be careful about the analysis right. of saying every time I pray therefore God will always send me along or that that happened because of my prayer because it may have, God may have said, oh, poor Kel, I must send that bus to him quickly. Then again, maybe God didn't. So does that mean that, that the things we see happening aren't self-explanatory, don't explain That's themselves? Right. That's right. And That's one of the great problems about miracles. I see something extraordinary and I give an explanation of it. My trouble is my explanation becomes the reality in my head. So you fall down on the ground and start making all kinds of strange noises. Could be having a fit, could be some epilepsy or something like this. You could say he always behaves like that. Could be saying, could be the devil. Yep. Uh, it, it could be you're showing off. It could be that you actually set this up with the others just to make me look foolish in front of the camera as I try or, and work out what's Kel doing down on the floor. And well, it could be imitative. Talking. I've seen someone else do could this and I think it's what the group expects of me. That's right. So I've got a whole range of could-be's. Yes. 
When someone comes along and says, oh, that's the devil, and everyone around says, oh, that's what it is. That's what the devil does. Yes. You see? And so then you, you, you assume it's true. It's, I've never really worked it out. I've studied it a little bit. But uh, it's like hypnotism. You know? there's, there's a whole... You remember the old hypnotist shows? They used to, sh- they used to give a kind of an aura of, of, of believability about... Yes. Yes. The, what was his name, Franklin? The great Franklin he used to build himself as. The, gra- the fact that he's great, you see. <laughs> yes. And you see him hypnotise some people and you think, he has power. He has yes. some... But my experience of hypnotism is that it's just a biofeedback system. It's not all that hard to work out how to do it or what it is. It works with certain kinds of personalities, suggestible people, more than it does with others. People and... used to say things like, don't look in his eyes. Yeah, don't look in his oh, eyes. Yeah, but if he did true. anything, he just talked to people. It was the yes. way he talked and the sound of his voice and... That triggered off... And they life. used to have, I don't know about him particularly, but they, those kinds of travelling shows used to find suggestible people who liked being hypnotised. Yes. So the first few ones would work, which would then make everybody else think he can do it and makes it more likely the next ones would. So the, the only ones he keeps on stage to do the clacking like a chicken routine are the ones he's worked out are susceptible. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, but the definition, the explanation of what's happening defines the reality so much so that you think that what the explanation is is true. Right. Now, the important thing about the miracles of Jesus is not that they're miraculous or that they're gee whiz wonder things. It's what they signify. Right. It's the explanation, not the event. Yes. If I'd come along as a hypnotist and I said I'd been given special powers by UFOs that had visited us and people believed that, that explanation controls... That's right. What they see. That's right. But so, it, yeah, so, so it's the explanation that The matters. explanation becomes critical. So yes. gee, Jesus says, remember the parable of the, the rich man and the poor man, and they both die. Yes. The, the, I'm going to get this right way now. The rich man goes into Hades and is punished, and the poor man is up on Abraham's bosom, which yes. I always thought was a very strange place to be as a child, because I thought bosom was a naughty word that only women had them anyway. And so <laughs> why Abraham had one, I don't know, and why he was on it, I could never work Meanwhile, out. Meanwhile, there's the Meanwhile, poor old rich man saying, send me a drink of cold water, it's yes. pretty hot here. And uh, Abraham says, no, come be done. There's a gulf between the two of us that can't be crossed. And so he says, well, send him back to warn my brothers. Right. Now, Abraham says at that point, your brothers have Moses and the prophets. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if someone rises from the dead. So Moses and the prophets means scripture, yep. the Bible. And if the they won't, won't read the Bible, and if they won't believe the Bible, then they won't believe in even someone coming no, back from right. the dead. Because it'll be, ah, oh, that's smoke and mirrors, because their father yes. told them. Yes, so their interpretation will block out. Will block out what the reality is. And yep. so there is no miracle that can persuade anybody. A friend of mine sat up all night with a Hindu once explaining about the resurrection of Jesus. And after looking at all the evidence, as the man said in the end, yes, I believe you're right, he did rise from the dead. And so my friend said, you'll become a Christian then, will you? And the Hindu said, no, there's lots of people who have risen from the dead in India. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the case of Pincus Lapidus. Yes. The Jewish scholar who came to the same conclusion and remained Jewish. And remained Jewish and re-explained the whole history of Israel to take into account the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Yes. Because the evidence was overwhelming, but he couldn't believe that Jesus so was the Messiah. They won't believe what the Bible is really saying. They won't believe even if a man comes That's back right. from the dead. And so Jesus warns us against people who believe because of miracles. The end of John chapter 2, he, he, yes, doesn't, he right. doesn't trust them, does he? He doesn't trust himself to people who believe because of miracles. Right. And it's a really intri- interesting introduction to Nicodemus. See, our Bibles are chopped up into chapters by people hundreds of years later. But if you just forget the chapters, Jesus doesn't trust any man who, because Jesus knows what's in a man, who believes because of miracles. Now, there was a man called Nicodemus, and he came to Jesus at night and he says, you must come from God because of the miracles that you're doing. And we've just been sent a signal saying, don't trust trust this man. And so Jesus says to him, before he's even asked a question, Jesus says, you've got to be born again. Uh, Believing in me because you've seen me do miracles is not what Christianity is about. Yes. Being born again is what Christianity is about. And it's it's interesting, again, at the end of chapter 4 of John's Gospel, Same kind of thing. Jesus says, we're told, Jesus went to his home country. And then we're told, uh, a prophet is without honour in his own hometown. So you're expecting it, therefore, the home country people won't accept him because the prophets got no honour. Going back to his home, no honour. That's right. right. And says, they welcomed him because they'd seen the miracles in Jerusalem. 
They're, they're false. welcoming him and honouring him in the wrong way for the, the wrong, wrong reason. For the wrong reason. Because right. they'd seen the miracles, but they hadn't understood the miracles. And if you see a miracle but don't understand it, then it, you've lost completely. So the important thing is not that it is a gee whiz, wonder, astonishing marvel. The important thing is, what does the miracle signify? What does it symbolise? What is the... What is the message that the, the, the miracle is sending to us? Uh, there's, a, there's a lovely one in Mark chapter 6. Jesus has just fed the multitude in the wilderness. And then he sends the disciples away in a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee and the great storm comes. Uh, Jesus then walks across the water and walks as if he's going to go beyond them and they call out to him, and he climbs into the boat and says, don't be afraid, it is I. Now, all that is a fairly astonishing. Here is the walking on the water, the feeding of the multitude. Right? Yeah, this is all pretty slack, George. How do you explain that yes. good grief stuff? And we're in the good grief. How do you explain it? Where's the natural law, all this? Yes. But what it says there is, they didn't believe in him because they didn't understand about the loaves. Yes, and you think... Hang huh? on, he's just walked on the water. What have the loaves got to do with it? What have the loaves got to do with it? In yes. fact, we tend to think, well, I don't understand the loaves either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm in the wrong group here. This is multiplying the loaves and fishes to yeah. feed thousands. Yeah. Now, what's it about? Well, the Old Testament tells us to look forward to another Moses and another Exodus, greater and bigger than the one that was there. Right. When Moses was travelling across the wilderness with the people under the hand of God, he fed the, wil the multitudes in the wilderness. With the manna. With the manna. Jesus is now feeding the multitude in the wilderness. And Moses led the people across the, the sea. So understanding the loaves is saying, this is the this second is the Moses, Moses who was promised. Yes. yes. And so I shouldn't be surprised when he leads me in safety across the ocean, across right. the sea. Because Moses did exactly the same thing yes, at the Red Sea. Yes. And if I had understood the miracle, yes. the sign then I would have understood what Jesus was doing. So the understanding, the interpretation, vastly more important than the other. Vastly more important. Yes. And consistently in the New Testament, the understanding is the Old Testament. If you know Moses and the prophets, you'll understand if someone rises from the dead. But if you don't know Moses and the prophets, you don't know what it means when someone rises from the dead. So if we're going to understand what any of these things mean, we have to get them in a biblical perspective. Absolutely. Because the resurrection, for example is the judgment day. Because right. in, Ex in Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, which speak of the resurrection, or in Daniel chapter 12, which speak of the resurrection, it's the end of the world and the judgment of the world has commenced. So that when Jesus rises from the dead, the Apostle Paul says to the uh, Athenians, he says, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by a man, and of this he's given evidence by raising him from the dead. Sign the judgment has come. The sign the judgment's come. And we're living in a kind of prolonged judgment day yes. where God is giving generations yes. the opportunity to turn back to him before. That's right. And we're living now in the age when Satan has been defeated and where the judge, the king, is now on the throne and he's pouring out his spirit upon people through the preaching of the gospel, bringing them to new birth. So that's what the resurrection means, not just a dramatic event that happened. It's what Pincus Lapide missed. It's what the Hindu missed. missed, what it means. What it means. And what it means, of course, is the gospel, and that today people can be born again. Yes. Now, are there miracles today? Of course there are. Because God is constantly at work in everything in the world. But the great miracle that defies human understanding is rebirth. So when Jesus says, you will do greater things than me, what ordinary Christians do is tell people about Jesus. Yes. And people are born again yes. to eternal life yes. and never die. That's right. And it's an astonishing thing because you can talk to people, the cows come home, they're not going to be born again. It's yes. only by the power of the Spirit of God that someone who is dead in their sins and trespasses, an enemy of God, who is doomed to eternal punishment, turns around and accepts God, repents of their past life and accepts the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and then starts to live a changed and transformed life. You see, educators can teach minds, but they can't change hearts. God changes hearts. Governments can change yes. laws and rules and regulations, but they can't change hearts. Yes. Every treasurer would love, every tax commissioner would love 
for people in a civil a society that wanted to pay tax, that <laughs> wanted to be honest, yeah. they can't. All they can do is put more rules, regulations, penalties and, and inducements. But God changes hearts. And God changes hearts when we tell people his message from yeah. his book, which is why the gospel is the power of God That's unto right. salvation for all who believe. And that wonderful story of Mr. Eternity, you know, the little yes. petty crim, alcoholic, wife bash, the man whose life was completely down the gutter. And yet he heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and completely changed as a person for the rest of his life. Stopped drinking completely. Arthur Stace yes, was his Arthur name. Stace. And yes. no longer criminal. Went around writing eternity on the footpaths of Sydney, all over Sydney, because he wanted people to know of eternity and to think of eternity and of their eternity. Yes. Where, will, where will you spend eternity was yes. the question, wasn't it? That's right. And yes. so... The what, Judgment Day question. What, that's right. What changed him? Why? It was, the, it was the gospel word. Now, that is the big miracle. But most people don't see it. Yes, because they don't see what it means. They don't oh, understand the point. They don't understand it. Okay. They can't see it. Whereas a party trick, ooh, gee. A spectacular really party spectacular. trick. Spectacular, yes, yeah. Yes. And I say, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> so the important thing is to know your Bible really well because that's where God gives us the information about what these things mean. Yes. So we need to spend time here, don't we, looking that's at what right. the Bible says about miracles. That's right. And so then we can say, that is a miracle. That is just an extraordinary thing. That's all we're meaning. It's an extraordinary thing. And rather than that is a suspension of some closed world order of mechanism. So God is there, molecule by mon molecule, nanosecond by nanosecond, holding it together, which means we, A, can be contented, and yeah. B, we can go to him whenever we, we have got a problem because and he's in charge. It. That's right. Yeah. So there you are, big topic, and we've just started to look at it. Would be a good idea for you to talk about this with your prayer and Bible study group show them the DVD, chat about the topic, look at what the Bible says, look at what Jesus says about miracles, and, and make sure we're looking at it from the Bible's perspective. Yes, that's very important. We've got to understand what the Bible is saying about the miracle to understand the miracle. So there you are. That's what you need to do. If you'd like to hear more from Philip Jensen, come along to the St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney any time. Be delighted to see you. Cup of tea, cup of coffee, chat, and some good Bible teaching. We'd like to see people come, don't we? Always, especially if they're going to come to hear what God has to say. Exactly. Until next time on The Chat Room, thank you for your company. Philip, thank you for yours. It's a pleasure.